Alrighty, welcome everyone to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist, and today, super exciting guest, Phil Drysdale. Uh, we've both been li- listening to Phil Drysdale's podcast for the last few months, and really connected. I think Phil has a, a very similar style to us, conversational, but also one that really wants to relate, wants to give people a platform and a space where they can work shit out. I mean, that's the reality. We're all in a space. We're forever learning. So welcome, Phil. Hey, glad to be here. Excited. So Phil, today we're going to talk about deconstruction, right? And that's that's your specialty. That's your area of specialty. So before we get into defining deconstruction and what deconstruction is all about, help our audience find out a little bit about you. So who is Phil Drysdale? What's your backstory? And how did you become so immersed in this idea of deconstruction? Sure. So I am a pastor's kid, PK. So I grew up in the church. I got saved multiple times all the way through my childhood, you know, double check, you know, make sure. Um, But probably wasn't that into Christianity as a kid. I mean, I, I went to Sunday school. I could give you all the answers. I knew the memory verses. And I think they got you some candy or something I was pretty good at it was kind of like the old man's game, you know, it was like for my parents and all those old people in their thirties and forties, you know? (laughs) Um, And uh, it was only really when I became sort of a teenager that I started to be like, hold on, this is this, I'm really into this. We we moved home. My dad was no longer a pastor. So we weren't in like these churches that my dad got assigned and my parents could finally pick a church. And up until I was about 15, 16, we've been part of these churches that were like, they really were. I mean, I joke about, you feel like 30, 40 year olds are really old when you're kids, but most of these churches were like 60 plus. They were like dying churches. My dad was sent in to revitalize. Um, and that was him getting young families and still not very relevant to me as a, you know, 10, 12, 13 year old. So when he got to pick a church, he picked the largest youth group in the city. He didn't care what the church's background was. He didn't even care if they believed what we believed massively. He was like, I want my kids immersed in a church where there's other people his age, their age. And so I went along and suddenly like, I'm like, whoa, there's a lot of people my age. This is really interesting. It's maybe actually is relevant. You know, it's not just for my parents. And so about 15, 16, I got really into it. And if I'm honest, the primary uh, draw initially was that there were other girls in the youth group um, that were pretty. And that was basically the reason I kind of hung around the first few weeks. But before long, I really, I bought in, I bought in hard. I'm an interesting mix of autism and, um, and ADHD where um, probably more my autistic side, but also my hyperfixation of ADHD. I am a hundred percent in something, and then I'm a hundred percent off on something else. Like I'm very, very all in or black and white. Very, very, um, yeah, binary in the way I see things a lot of the time. And so I bought in hard. I read every single passage in the Bible. I went to every single home group. Every, I mean, I was in multiple home groups at sixteen. You know what I mean? Um, and I didn't just go to the youth stuff. I went to the adult stuff. I was like, well, if this thing's real, I am doing it. Um, and I really threw myself into church before long i was so into it that i had to obviously change church because this church was clearly wrong um they've interpreted some things wrong so again i'm very very black and white and and i think a lot of christians can be um as they grow and they develop and they're praying and they're reading their bible they start to see things differently and then they start to question maybe is this church right maybe i'm not a aog maybe i'm a baptist or maybe i'm not baptist maybe i should be off in the charismatic movement or whatever it is um, and so I bounced around a few churches in my late teens, early 20s, trying to figure out what was right, always from this perspective of like, I need to figure this out. Like, I want to be the best Christian I can ever be. And so I always laugh when people talk about people that deconstruct and go, oh, they never really cared or they never really understood the Bible. Or, like, I'm talking to people, two ex-pastors, right? I mean, like, you know, we, we knew our stuff, you know, we were teaching to people that say, oh, they never really believed. <laughs> And so I got really into it before long. um, I had been running a business for a few years, um, early 20s. And I found out about a really big movement that was happening in America where they were healing people and they were seeing amazing things happen. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? I was working in the oil industry and the IT. And I was like, all I'm doing is making oil (laughs) CEOs richer, really, in the grand scheme of things. And these people are talking about going into hospitals and like, you know, clearing them out and, you know, and uh, praying for people that have cancer and they get healed and all these kind of miraculous things I'm reading about and hearing about on podcasts and sermons and things. And I'm like, what the hell am I doing with my life? I'm going to go just, so I left my business. I gave it away to my, I, it was a split between three of us. Uh, we started it together. So I just gave them my shares, walked away with nothing and went straight to America and got heavily involved in that. Again, very all in. I, I, I don't do things by halves. 
and got involved there for many years. Um, in the midst of that, I started writing. I started doing podcasts. Um, I knocked Joseph Prince off the number one spot on Christianity for a while on iTunes back when I don't know there was rankings on iTunes. Is there still rankings on iTunes? I don't really know. I don't. I don't. You'd think I have a podcast. I should know these things, but I really don't. <laughs> it's probably just too depressing to look. <laughs> while, we, while you talk, Phil, I'll look up your rankings and let you know. Oh, it's it's going to be bad. I mean, I've, I've not podcast for months. I Again, my ADHD, I hyperfixate. I bring out three podcasts that are four hours long a week. And then like after three months, I do nothing for like four months. So uh, people have to roll with me. That's probably terrible for uh, how you get ranked and rated. Um, but yeah, I, I was really passionate about what I was doing. I started to travel around the world. I had spoken in churches and conferences. I spoke in ministry schools and colleges. Um, and I was really, really passionate about what I did, but constantly trying to seek what's the right thing. How to, how do you be the best Christian you can be? And in the midst of constantly pushing that envelope, pushing that question, reading everything I could find. Um, you know, I was part of ministry school at one point and I laughed because my roommate was like mind blown by my approach. They gave us a book to read and it was, um, this very charismatic book about healing. And I was like, well, that's the only book I have to read this week. And I'm in ministry school. I've got as much time as I could have. And so I picked up a couple of books uh, down at uh, the, the bookstore. And, and my roommate comes in one day and I've got three books open on my desk. And it's Bill Johnson's When Heaven Invades Earth. Good charismatic book. John Piper, God is the Gospel. <laughs> about as opposite as you could think. And then the third book is Brian McLaren's A New Type of Christianity. I mean, like you're talking like, the most bizarre different spreads you could have. And so I was always someone that exposed myself to different views. I, I never wanted to be closed minded in my Christianity. I wanted to see what other people thought. Um, and so in doing that, I was constantly eroding my belief and building new beliefs and constantly doing that. And I think just gradually over, gosh, probably a decade or so, certain beliefs that were very core to most people's Christianity starting to bleed into maybe some creedal kind of stuff, you know, not just, you know, you think it's mid-trib, not post-trib or post-trib, not pre-trib. Those kind of periphery things. Those are big questions I started to have. I started to change what I believe. And you're going around the world and preaching in churches and stuff, and you're like, I'm not sure what I believe here, or I believe something different. I can't talk about that. So let's talk about something that's off to the side here. And in the midst of that, I'm traveling around the world speaking, and dozens and dozens of people are coming to me every time I speak saying, hey, you're not going to be back here. I'm not after that message. Um, can I can I ask you a couple of questions? And you won't tell my pastor, right? And I'm like, sure. You know, and suddenly I'm having all these people everywhere I go. You know, ten plus people at every church I go to, conferences, talking to dozens of people. They're asking me, "Do you really think God's going to send people to hell? That seems kind of different to Jesus." Or, "Do you really think that my gay brother is going to go to hell? Do you really think that?" that the God of the Old Testament is a good God? Like, that seems contrary. I don't see how you can be God looks like Jesus, but God also performs infanticide and uh, sanctions rape and other kind of crazy things. And I started to realize this journey that I've been going on, and in the same time kind of trying to navigate some sort of Christian ministry whilst massively deconstructing behind the scenes, there's thousands and thousands of people going through this process and they have no one to talk to unless some random bloke shows up in their church and gives a terrible message and they think, this guy's got some screws loose, maybe we should talk to him. And so over the years, I kind of, I basically gradually transitioned. I started to try and help people um, feel safe to be able to talk about their questions they had. I started to um, hold things a lot more loosely as far as how people went on that journey. Uh, initially, I thought still there was some sort of Christian goal at the end. And I very quickly realized that's not going to work for everyone. It just doesn't necessarily work for me. And so I ended up helping people over the last maybe sort of nine, eight, nine, ten years. I've been helping people that are going through that process of deconstructing their faith, of unraveling different core components of their faith and trying to find meaning in the world and some sort of identity within the world, um, some way to frame faith in the world. Um, so yeah, it's a very condensed, but still long story. No, no. And, and it's great. And it's a great lead in to, to where you are. And because we are going to really try and unpack, um, for lack of a better word, or probably it's the app word, um, the deconstruction narrative, talk us through, just give us a little bit of a, to the novice listening, what is deconstruction? Sure. So if you, 
type in deconstruction to Google and hit return, you're going to find a lot of different results and you're going to find a few different kind of um, definitions out there. So you'll find like a layman's dictionary definition of deconstruction, which might be sort of, if you think of construction, someone plowing a wrecking ball through your house, you've just deconstructed your house, right? Um, and to be honest with you, if you have deconstructed your faith, that probably feels quite apt in a lot of ways. Um, but it is somewhat limiting. And so that may work for some people, but this is where you get a lot of people that identify deconstruction as a very destructive process. But deconstruction, as we're talking about it here, actually can be a very constructive process as well. The second thing that you're going to find that's really common is going to be the postmodern philosophy of deconstruction, Jack Derrida, constructivism, things like that. And again, there's a lot of similarities in that, but it's not something that I would say most people that identify as deconstructing in this kind of movement, this uh, community, most people probably wouldn't fully identify with something like postmodern thought of deconstruction. And so what we're talking about, we did this through our research projects. We, we gathered data. We, we looked at over a thousand people that identify as deconstructing and basically reverse engineered and said, well, who are these people? What, what are they like? What's happened to them? And um, we found three components. And so the first component is that they had questioned core values of their faith. Now, a lot of people have done that, right? So you can still be a very conventional Christian and have questioned core values of your faith. Um, and so it's definitely uh, the only marker. So there are more markers to go. But the, it is important we highlight that it is core values. So a lot of people talk about questioning and, oh, I question my faith and I've changed some of my beliefs. It has to be core values. So like people that, like we mentioned the pre-trip, mid-trip or something earlier, that in some churches might get you like, you know, seen as a bit of a crazy guy. Oh, look at, look at Jeff over there. He is a post-trip guy. Psh, nut job. Like what a, what a psycho. Um, but you're not going to get kicked out of church for having a slightly different belief on when Jesus comes back during the rapture or after the rapture or things like that. But if you come to the front and go, hey, I'm not sure I believe Jesus was the son of God. Um, or you cut the front and go, you know, I don't think anyone goes to hell. I think everyone gets to go to heaven. For a lot of churches, these are real core values. These are like in the statement of faith on the church website. These are maybe implicated in some of the creeds, you know, really core, core values across like this would isolate you out of most churches. You know, you would run out of church options very quickly if you believed some of these kind of things were more to the point, didn't believe some of these things. So the way I help people recognize if it's a core value of the questioning is I say, imagine you're going to tell your pastor that this question you have. If you start sweating and getting stressed and anxious, you're probably questioning a core value. If you think your pastor is probably going to be pretty chill about you asking that question, it's probably not a core value for your movement. Um, and so you question that. But that, I mean, lots of people question it. Lots of people have gone, you know, is, it, is God really good murdering all these people and sanctioning all this uh, genocide in the Old Testament? But they kind of seem fairly happy when the pastor goes, yeah, but God's ways are not our ways. Or, um, oh, well, they were worshipping demonic gods and God had to purify the bloodline or, you know, whatever kind of weird answers we get. For some reason, we kind of look at that and go, yeah, OK, that makes sense. And I know that because I accepted some of those answers for many, many years. The second component of deconstruction is that the faith tradition's answers no longer satisfy that question. And so it could be that the question isn't actually a new question. It's just that you no longer accept the answer that you've had all along. The second component of the second question is that the faith tradition's answers no longer satisfy. And so you have to start seeking your own answer. And this is why I don't like talking about deconstruction as an entirely destructive process, because you look across the, the, the broad spectrum of people that deconstruct and every single one of them has built new beliefs in some way, shape, or form. Even if it's, I don't believe in God, that's a belief. <laughs> you believe there is no God. And so, or if you believe, I'm not sure there's a God, that's a belief as well. You, you have some form of belief here. So you're switching beliefs, you're changing beliefs, you're transitioning in your beliefs. And the third component, and this is really important because you actually will find some people, maybe they grew up in a very progressive um, home and they, they actually had a very progressive view of Jesus maybe. And they... Um, they deconstruct that and they go back to, not back, but they, they move into a very fundamental type of church, a, a conventional church. And they might go, oh, well, I did deconstruction. So it's not just, you know, this move away from conventional Christianity or conventional faiths. The difference is that they don't tick this third marker. The third marker is that when you deconstruct, your new beliefs are beliefs you hold more lightly than your old beliefs. You have less fundamentalism in you. You have less... 
a dualistic approach to life. You don't see the world in such black and white binary uh, ways. You don't go, well, I used to be a Christian. I knew that was right, but now I know this is right. You might go, I'm going to live as though this is right, but I'm going to hold it lightly because I've been, I've been wrong before and I'm open to evidence. I've, I've changed the way I see things. And so those are your three main markers. Again, I've kind of dragged that out, but I think it's quite important to kind of um, draw a box around this kind of term and, and go, this is kind of what we're talking about when we talk about people that are quote unquote deconstructed Christians. There's a lot there. It's funny when I was listening to you talking about, you know, core core doctrines or core beliefs or not, I was thinking, Brian, about your favorite verse about the penises like horses and the and the emissions. I was just wondering <laughs> if that would be one that would make you sweat talking to your pastor. I, I do I do love the fact that Phil straight away went, Ezekiel. So yes, you're right. Ezekiel twenty three twenty. I used to write it in people's cards, like if I wrote in birthday cards or generally not like, um, uh, you know, condolences card or something. But outside of that remit, definitely that was one that goes, because it's one that people don't have memorized unless they're like me and you. And so they're going to look it up. You know, they're going to look it up and it's going to give them a good laugh or worse, but that's going to give me a good laugh. So No, it's, it's good. It's good to find another sick bastard around. So I love it. <laughs> Yeah, that's another sick bastard that knows the Bible very well. Hey, so your website, Phil, which we're going to unpack later, we're going to get to this and talk all about the Deconstruction Network, but your website says that 2,700 Americans are leaving the church each day, yet 78% yeah. of those claim to retain a level of faith. So is this saying that the church no longer has the power or the pull that it once had? Sure. So actually, this is a, these are quite old statistics as well. So it's, those are from 2004 and 2000, uh, sorry, 2014 and 2000. And- 12 respectively um so the the number of people leaving the church in america every day is is definitely on the rise from even that number um so that in 2014 a million people were leaving the church a year astonishing like amount of people when you consider um this is the first year in 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 recorded history where under half america half of america uh, attend church under half of america are membership in a church under half of america believe with no doubt there is a God. Like th- these numbers are dropping radically. But what's interesting is that when you look at the data of what happens to these people that leave church, now it's important that we recognize deconstruction is not de-churched. And so this is actually why I started to do research in deconstruction is there's a kind of bizarre, weird gray area that kind of exists in the in the blob in the middle between um, people that are fairly sure in what they believe, you know, atheist or Buddhist or Christian or Muslim or Mormon or whatever you might be, there's a very big gray area of people that are still open or they're unsure or they're figuring things out, or maybe they are fairly sure about something, but they don't fit in any of the categories very cleanly. Um, And deconstructing Christians often fall into that bracket. What we know from some of the more recent data is, only 13% of people that deconstruct end up atheist, which is a really low number. Uh, really fascinating, actually. Could be as high as 15 in certain countries. It's a bit higher. It might get as high as 20% in certain countries. But the vast majority of people that deconstruct tend to hold to some form of agnostic belief of, of I don't know. I'm not sure. I am open, but I don't know. And a huge percentage of them still believe in some higher power or something spiritual going on in the world that's not just physical, tangible, objective reality, if there is such a thing as objective reality. It's fascinating to me because what we tend to do is we tend to broadly stroke assume that people that leave church or say, I'm not sure I'm a Christian anymore or whatever, they all get thrown into one category. Um, and I think that's really unfair. And so this is why we started to do our study and look at this. We found that um, about 25% of people that deconstruct their faith still attend church at least once a week. That's really interesting to me. And that doesn't matter how long you've been deconstructing. So if you've just started to deconstruct, the, the, the numbers are still there. They're between sort of 20, 25%, depends on countries and stuff as well. But if you're 10 years in, you're still looking at about 20 to 25% of people that deconstruct are still attending at least once a week in a church. Um, And so most of them, when we look a bit closer, they've started to attend things like progressive churches, house churches, more churches that might have a bit more freedom, a bit more um, room for them to express and believe slightly differently, but they still 
attend a church. And as much as 30% of people that deconstruct from Christianity still identify as Christian. And that, again, also carries on with with time. So a lot of people go, oh, well, that's probably skewed by early numbers. People that go, well, no, I'm definitely still Christian. And then over time, their faith seems to peter out. But what's interesting is, while that's true, that that is definitely the trajectory for a lot of people. Some people early on really try and cling on to their faith, which would be natural if you believe in hell and you believe in a God and things like that. You would try and hold on to that, but maybe you would find some new evidence that makes you question it. It actually seems that a lot of people that start to shift away from Christianity seem to shift back towards identifying with Christianity in some way, shape or form as well. And so it's really hard to do broad strokes when we're looking at Christianity, uh, at deconstruction, sorry, um, because there is such a diverse kind of landing spot. Uh, if there is a landing spot, people seem to be moving around a lot. People seem to be questioning. Um, and one person's journey is going to look very different to another person's. Yeah, that's one thing that we're big on with our podcast is that, and you know, and with our audience as well, is that we don't tell people, here's the path. It's more a trajectory. Here's a, here's a direction. Mm -hmm. But I do want to come back to what you were saying there. You know, you're saying, you know, 20 to 30%, 25% of people hold on to some semblance of Christianity, but still that's 80 and, you know, 70 and 80% of people are walking away. Can you yeah, talk a little bit about absolutely. that? Absolutely. Sure. And I mean, I think this is really um the crux of the matter is is majority of people that are deconstructing their faith even people that hold on to christianity and hold on to even attending church um many of them have major problems with much of christianity whether it's institutionally whether it's theologically um there are still many hurdles and barriers even to those that still remain never mind the people that don't um and so i think for a lot of people that deconstruct, um, a lot of the sparks that occur um, are things like theological issues. They are things like church abuse and scandals and fraud and lots of things that the church has done that pushes people away from church, pushes people away from the theology of, of Christianity, because some of the theology that's been um, held to for many years can be really toxic, can be really harmful for a lot of people. Um, and so, yeah, I think... It shouldn't be a surprise that we are seeing more people not hold on to some form of Christian faith. Or if they do hold on to Christian faith, they're not wanting to identify as Christian. Because this is an interesting dynamic as well. I bet a lot of people that click that don't know, not sure how to identify myself, probably hold on to some very Christian ideologies and some very Christian ideas. Might even still pray to Jesus or talk to Jesus, but they don't want to identify as Christian, because actually that word has become, I'm sure you've heard this many times, that word, just identifying with the movement of Christianity feels like something I don't want to do anymore now that I see it in a certain way that isn't very favorable. Um, and so you get a lot of people that talk about maybe spiritual but not religious. Um, I'm trying to see my stats, I can't remember off the top of my head. Spiritual not religious, actually quite a small percentage, about 13% identify as spiritual but not religious. Um, but those types of people often hold very uh, strong beliefs that are familiar or, or ancillary to Christianity, but they don't want to identify as Christian. But again, I would say a huge amount of people, I think the very nature of Christianity, uh, of deconstruction, which is to become less fundamental, to become more open, to ask more questions, to look at things more critically. So many of these components are key in the psycho psychology of people that deconstruct. We're going to be, have a few more studies in the next year and a half, two years. We're going to be looking at some of the psychological components that have gone on. What we find generally is that deconstruction most people in faith fixate about what people believe, the, the what people believe. And so they look at someone that deconstructs and go, oh, they stopped believing in God, or they stopped believing that Jesus is God, or they stopped believing that God sent Jesus to die on a cross or whatever. They look at the what. But what's interesting is, generally speaking, the, the change in what people believe is not key to deconstruction. What's interesting in what's happening in the person that deconstructs is they changed how they believe and the what they believe was a side effect the how they believe this psychological change that's occurred is where they can now ask the same question why did god kill all those canaanites and say it was fine to kill their wives their babies and their dogs and you can keep the young woman and rape them though because hey you deserve something for all that hard fighting like 
that's a hard <laughs> passage to wrestle with as a Christian. But the how of how I think is a very fundamental conventional Christian accepts God saying, my ways are not your ways, pipe down in the back. But once I've started to go through a psychological change that starts to think more critically, that has evolved a bit more morally and goes, hold on, my ways are not my, your ways, does not make rape okay, does not make murdering an entire country okay. I'm not okay with that, God. You're going to have to give me a better answer. The, the how has changed internally of how I go about thinking. And therefore, most of the time, the what changes. And I think for a lot of people, a huge percentage of people, Christianity just doesn't have good answers once you start thinking very differently at a fundamental level. I agree. And a day is as a thousand years doesn't answer the reason why Jesus hasn't shown up in 2000 years after he gave the Right. You know, the, ser- the serious statement that he was going to be back in their lifetime kind of thing. And yeah. yet it did seem to work for a really long time, at least in my belief system. Well, I think it, I think it still does, doesn't it, for many? So the couple of thousand years on, they're going, no, it'll be soon. Look at it, just, just wait. Yeah. yeah. It's only been two days. Chill out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And this is the thing as well. This is the key thing I think is really important. It's a psychological change in how we think. Now, here's the thing. Someone that thinks differently is not less intelligent. So because some of these people that believe a day is a thousand years, these are really smart people. Some theologians that have got multiple doctorates, much, much smarter than you or I, we would have a conversation about how they've concluded something. And we'd be like, this guy's nuts. Like, is he even, he's not even thinking rationally. But I think what we fail to see is rational thinking. Everyone thinks rationally. They just think rationally based on their parameters of what rational thought is. It's why you can talk to your grandma about your deconstruction and she's going, well, but, but, but just think about it, Billy. If you just read First John 1, 2, then you would understand. And you're like, oh, this is how you rationally, cognitively process the world is through a Bible verse. But I don't. So now we're having this conversation. We're both able to rationally think. We're probably both very intelligent. But... We both think the other person is literally insane for not understanding our rational argument. And, and so you get nowhere once these kind of changes in how we think. So we talk about what we believe, but we don't really recognize that how we believe has changed. And I think that's where a lot of the impasse comes in a lot of our connections and, and relationships, because these people are smart, right? Because you and I were there, right? And we're smart. Um, so it's not that we became smarter. It's that we just started to think a very different way and started to put things together differently. Um, and people much smarter than you and I, well, certainly much smarter than I, I can't speak for you, are still in that world and still think it makes perfect sense. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely not an intelligence thing. I think a lot of people get up on a bit of a high horse and think, oh, I've, I'm just smarter. I've looked at this better than you. I've studied it more. And that may or may not be the case, but it's rarely about intelligence. It's certainly an interesting time at the moment. And, you know, you could write this off as confirmation bias or the power of the internet and being connected more into social media. But evangelicalism and Pentecostalism really seem to be at the fore at the moment in a lot of news. And I don't know what it's like in other parts of the world, but in Australia, Hillsong has really hit the news. And, you know, Hillsong's now in 30 other countries besides Australia. So they have become a bit of a a global movement. Um, And we recently interviewed Al Hardy. So she's an Australian journalist who's based in the States. And she's written this book called Beyond Belief, How Pentecostal Christianity is Taking Over the World. Fantastic book if you haven't read it. It's really interesting. You know, that talks really to that Pentecostalism is the fastest growing faith-based community globally. Like it's a massive movement. Um, And with evangelicalism and Pentecostalism among the only growing faith-based community, yet we've got people deconstructing and de-churching at even double that rate. So as popular as it might be, the deconversion and deconstruction is even more popular. What do you make of that? Sure. So they've done research in this. So this is really interesting. So in the West, you know, your English speaking countries in Europe, while evangelical is kind of treading water, it's growing, but it's pretty damn close to standing still. It's, it's, it's growing at a glacial pace. It's just that all the ch- other churches are shrinking so fast. It still looks pretty good. And the Pentecostal church as well, also growing. What's interesting is neither are growing particularly well in the West. They're, they're, close to treading water and what's interesting is what you find is most of their onboarding so they've got they actually are bleeding about the same sort of number as the rest of the churches 
But what they're doing, which is really interesting, is they're onboarding a lot of the other movements. And so a lot of people are coming from mainline churches. A lot of people are coming from uh, Jehovah Witness, uh, Mormons, and they end up going through evangelicalism or uh, Pentecostal churches and then often leave still and move on. Or they kind of find a home and go, yeah, this isn't as bad as what I've come from and it works for me and it's fine. It's really only in developing countries that Pentecostalism and evangelicalism is thriving. Um, and I think there's a lot of things to be said about it. There's a lot of cultural components. There's a lot of different things. And I think one of the things that we can't gloss over, because I think it does, a real, it does real harm to assume that everywhere in the world is in the same place and has the same cultural components, the same socioeconomic components, um, all sorts of different things are very different throughout the world. What you find is... In a lot of parts of the world, the church really works for a lot of people in the way that it worked for you and I for a long time. It really worked. It made sense in our worldview. It made sense with our um, our social backgrounds, our family dynamics, our work, whatever it was, uh, you know, our financial situation, our race, whatever it was, and even like our how stable life was. Um, for a lot of people around the world. Even a belief in the supernatural. Absolutely. How secular certain subcultures are, right? Uh, or how um, how much they've started to engage in scientific and, and educated at that level where, where scientific reason and, and, and those processes are applied. You look at certain parts of the world, education is crap, right? And there's some parts of the world, if you're just female, you don't get to go to to even primary school, never mind secondary school, never mind university. There's parts of the world where that's still an issue, which is awful and we need to fix that. But if you're in parts of the world where you're not getting educated and only one out of your four kids is getting educated, the capacity for you to engage with the Bible on that level is just not there. The capacity for you to find solace in a God that supports you and believes in you and and will uh, strengthen you and will provide financial care for you, even though maybe you aren't as qualified as the one person in your family that got to go to school. Or, you know, there's a lot of reasons here where religion, it's it's a really helpful tool. It's a really helpful mechanism. Even as a as a, a networking component, it's a very powerful thing. It's a very helpful thing. So there's, there's a lot that religion does that it's very easy for people once they come out of uh, religion to broad stroke and go, that was the worst thing ever. I hate it. It was rubbish. It was toxic. It was this, it was that. And yes, 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 yes. True. All of that is true for you. Absolutely. But if you take a step back, I bet you could look at it and go, huh, probably the reason I'm so great at podcasting is because I trained to be a pastor and do public speaking. Probably the reason I'm so good at making friends and connecting with people is because I was thrown into an environment every week where I had to talk with all these people of different generations, different backgrounds, different uh, races, different, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds. Like those are really helpful skills to learn. I've learned a lot of emotional um, intelligence. Uh, someone that's autistic, that's a really helpful thing to learn a lot of emotional intelligence because I spent lots of time praying and journaling and thinking about what do I feel and talking about that with God. Like, there's, there's a lot of good things in that. And I think there's a lot of parts of the world that that's a priority right now. If you look at things like hierarchy of needs, a lot of people in the West, the hierarchy of needs, church isn't ticking. They, they, they've covered things that the church would tick otherwise. That, that those, those things are, are there for them one way or the other. And so it becomes a lot less, do I need church? It becomes a lot less, becomes a lot more, do I believe in what this church is about and what it looks like? And and unfortunately or fortunately, that, that changes based on region, on circumstances. And so uh, I think there's a lot that evangelical church and Pentecostal church are doing that works in a huge portion of the world. And hopefully that does more good than harm because I don't see it changing anytime soon. I, I believe in a lot of ways it will do a lot of good. I think it's a really horrible stuff going on. I think there's a financial abuse, sexual abuse. There's a lot of toxic beliefs that are being taught. And, I, and it breaks my heart to see um, how much white saviorism is going on, how much of really, really fucked up racial components in, at play there. Lots of white people coming over to Africa, to Asia, telling people how to live. If you just become a bit more like us and Americans that are white, then you'll be better off. And uh, whatever it might be, um, there's a lot of really fucked up stuff please don't hear me wrong. But what I'm saying is, even with all that at play, it's working for people. Otherwise, they wouldn't be buying into it. And I think you can't dis disregard that. Whatever evangelicalism and Pentecostalism are doing for those parts of the world, people, communities, they're doing it right. 
Yeah, definitely. And, and look, I think this is something we quite often reflect on in our podcast as well, is that there there is some good stuff in it. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And Al Hardy, you know, she travelled to Africa, to Brazil, and, you know, she talks about the positive things and the positive change in some people's lives, leaning on those exact things that you just talked through. So, you know, it's not all bad. However, <laughs> there is a toxicity there that um, that is dangerous as well. Yeah, I, at the end of the day, people from America getting in their planes, going on their two-week mission trip to build a school or to, you know, help build an orphanage or whatever, would it be better if we didn't have them done a certain way? Yes. But is it a good thing that more kids in a deprived neighborhood are getting educated? No. That's, that's a great thing. Is it a bad thing that kids that would have grown up on the street without any parents, without any support network, are now in an orphanage where they get fed and educated? Of course, that's a great thing. Is it kind of messed up that we come in as white people and think we should be running the orphanage because that African person couldn't possibly teach children? Like, of course, that's the most fucked up white savory kind of thing in the world. So we could be doing this better, but it's probably it's working, right? It's, it's again, it, it works to some degree and it makes things better to some degree. And until it doesn't, I don't think that's going to change. But I do hope that we can at least put pressure on institutions like that to at least think about how they're doing these things to maybe consider doing them better. Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. Hey, coming back to deconstruction, a lot of people, when they start to deconstruct, they will get thrown at them. And I'm sure you've heard this. Oh, you just want to sin. Or, you know, the reason they're deconstructing is because they want, you know, X, Y, and Z. It's not really about deconstructing. But in fact, it's often a painful and lonely road for people and, you know, breakdown in relationships, excommunication even, breakdown in family relationships. Yet there's still these people that are compelled to go this road. And, you know, I've even heard Bart Campolo say, you know, deconstruction and deconversion was not a choice that he made. It was something that was thrust upon him. What leads people to go down this road? What do you think it is that actually pushes them? And also throwing in, what about the people that don't and the people that look at them and just don't get it? What's the difference between these two people? Yeah. So a a pet topic that I love studying is psychological development. There's, There's a lot of theories in how people evolve as they psychologically grow up. And so a really common one that you understand is because we all know this and most of us have kids and have seen it is child developmental psychology, right? You've heard of this whole field within psychology and it basically it's, it's, it's looking along a linear line. If you grab a thousand kids from anywhere in the world, you can probably point to certain ages and go around this age, that kid's going to start empathizing. And it's about five or six, give or take slightly different for, uh, for girls than boys, but, Five to six is roughly when a child will develop empathy. Around two or three, they're going to start to have their own self-identity. They're going to start screaming no. They're going to decide that they want a certain way of doing things. So you can look at certain ages and they're going to have these shifts in how they think, how they see the world, how they see themselves. You can do that with adults. So, and people don't realize this. So actually, there's been a lot of study in how do people grow up? How do people that are healthy, that keep maturing and changing, what changes occur? Um, So a lot of people aren't healthy. A lot of people don't have the the freedom to change and grow as well. There's there's a lot of pressure in society. If you are working three jobs and you're a single mom and you're just trying to get by, you're probably not spending a lot of time trying to better yourself, right? Versus if you're in a very comfortable, happy space, you probably are going to be able to spend more time working on yourself. So in that, we can see very clear directions in how people develop and how they grow. Um, I say all that because it's an interesting aside in some ways, but it isn't a thing that we can see in deconstruction. Again, this comes back to how people think. And so the reason some people don't and some people do is some people literally grow up. Physic- um, uh, psychologically, they grow up, they get older. Um, it's the same reason that if you had a 10-year-old and a 30-year-old sit down and say, could we talk about math? You're going to be able to talk about very different things right because one has probably got through high school and one has maybe even done some at university and the other is still 10 years old right they're not going to be able to talk about these things it's not saying a 10 year old is worse than a 30 year old it's a 10 year old is a 10 year old and a 30 year old is a 30 year old they're at the stage they are and that's okay 
Um, and so a large part of it is that people just haven't had the capacity, the freedom, the space, the desire to continue to grow and develop and to, to stretch how they see the world and think and how they see themselves, how they see God. And that's a major shift in difference between the person that changes and the person that doesn't. Um, as far as choice, it's really interesting. I, I, I love um, Bart's work and, and, and really respect his stuff. And I anecdotally for God, a decade have said, look, deconstruction is not a choice. Um, and I, and I still to some degree think it very much isn't a choice. What's really interesting is if you ask people that deconstruct, is it a choice? You get about a two out of three say it wasn't a choice to me, but one third will say they chose deconstruction, which is fascinating to me. I probably want to drill down on that more. We might even look at that in some further studies as to like, what choices did you make there? We'll probably drill down on people that answer that and go like, why did you make this choice? Like, Because I look at deconstruction, I'm like, there's no way in hell I would have picked this path. This is a painful, or ter terrible path, right? It's, it's, it's brutal. But the, the memes are out there, right? Like the people have uh, these tropes, these ideas, these myths of what deconstruction is. Oh, they never believed. Oh, they didn't know their Bible well enough. Oh, they just wanted to go off and sin, whatever it is. What's interesting is almost every popular statement you'll hear about people that deconstruct is very rarely true. Um, what we do know from the data is that people that deconstruct, when they were in their faith and happy with their faith, um, if you compare them to people that stay, the people that left, on average, attended church more. They were more involved in church. They were more likely to be employed by the church. They were more likely to be pastors. They were more likely to have theology degrees or have been to seminary. They read their Bible more often. They prayed more often. They were more committed by every metric a Christian would make up to try and measure a good Christian. People that deconstructed were generally speaking, and there's going to be outliers here. There's going to be some people that weren't that fuss. Generally speaking, they were way more into their faith than the average person that's still sitting on a pew today. And so what's interesting is one of the things I can say for sure, if you're a pastor and you want to stop people deconstructing is try and make people a little bit more blase about their faith. Try and make sure the people in your church aren't that into this. Because that's one of the best ways you can guarantee they kind of hang around. Like, according to the data, people that are really into this and really throw themselves into it, throw themselves into church life, throw themselves into their faith, really get to know the Bible, study it really to a very high degree, those people are much more likely to leave. And so we did an interesting poll recently. So Pew Research Center did a study on how well people understand the faith and faiths of others. And in that, they looked at how well people know the Bible. And so they broke it down by different faith groups and, and different Christian groups is what we kind of zoomed in on. And what's interesting is evangelicals and Mormons, uh, Latter-day Saints, are the two groups of Christians that know uh, the Bible the best. Um, and they were given six, like, painfully easy answers. Like, who wrote the book of Mark? Anyone? You got any ideas? Right? Not a hard question. Where was Jesus from? Where, no, sorry. Where was Jesus born? I think it was like not a hard question. If you've been around a church for more than 20 minutes, you know, um, who did David kill in the Bible? What, how did Noah escape the flood? Like Ark, Goliath, like Bethlehem. These are not hard questions. Evangelicals and Mormons score the best. They score it out of those six questions. On average, they get a 74%. Which to me is kind of terrifying, right? Because that's kind of funny. Because uh, I would think if you, like, I would have got 100% every time when I was in church. Maybe it give me enough time out of church and I might forget stuff. But you ask Christian, uh, you ask deconstructing Christians these questions. We did a poll of over 900 deconstructing Christians, picked a complete random, and on average they scored 91%. And some of these people had been deconstructed for over 10 years. You know, like some of these people have not picked up a Bible in 10 years and they're still scoring higher. These people knew their Bible. Um, and so again and again and again, when we look at different studies, different polls, different surveys that have been done, people that leave the church, people that deconstruct their faith, people that deconvert generally were more passionate about their faith than the ones that did. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think these memes of uh, like, oh, yeah, they never really, like, you know, it's just who cares? That's not true. I think in a lot of ways it's projection. We need to believe those that in the church still and that are happy with their Christian faith, they need to believe that you and I were different than they were. Because really the worst outcome is that they're looking in a mirror and they realize they're one wrong question 
at one wrong time and they could be us. They could be next. And that's the fear. So they have to discredit that we weren't really like them. One wrong question away from a podcast. Yeah, absolutely. That's basically it. On a, It seems for, and it certainly feels like that. And I think that if we probably could, drill down and follow someone very closely Truman show style or something like that. We probably find that almost everyone's deconstruction was a very slow drawn out process. And you could maybe look at key points and go, Oh, here's here. It's starting. It's starting to unravel here. Oh, that's another, you know, threads pulled out of that Jersey. But for most of us, it didn't feel like a long drawn out process. We probably had some key moments, maybe even one key moment where it was like, that's it. Boom, it just kind of blew up. Uh, a lot of people, they cite things like the Trump election and how the church, you know, backed Trump so heavily. Um, a lot of people talk about the pandemic response. A lot of people talk about social justice issues, maybe the way that the church uh, responded when they came out as um, LGBTQ, or maybe how the church responded to Black Lives Matter and, and racial issues. So there's these key things that some people can point to and go, that's why I deconstructed. But I have a feeling, generally speaking, if you looked a bit closer, you would see a long drawn out process of someone growing up psychologically, starting to see the world differently, starting to ask questions, starting to develop morally. We talk about developmental theory. Um, there's a whole subsection of developmental theory that is about how morality grows with people as they evolve. And generally speaking, if you grow up and develop your morality, a lot of things that are in the church and Christianity just don't work anymore. Those are very, very... Um, primitive in as far as moral development goes uh, they're, they're at the, some of the base levels of moral development we see most teenagers have a more complex morality than the average person in a conventional church mm, it's interesting isn't it I, I guess on on reconstruction like do you think it's something I, I mean it's a messy process to deconstruct and you know there's it's definitely not a linear one but does deconstruct oh, sorry reconstruction always need to be intentional or do you think it could be organic? Or sometimes do you think reconstruction is actually not even possible? I personally don't like the term reconstruction. Um, so there's a few different reasons. I don't mind people using it. And I think it's helpful for a lot of people, especially as they kind of see their life in different stages. So, you know, you look at someone like Richard Rohr's following upwards, he would very much have like, you know, different stages of life. And you probably see after the kind of following, you kind of like start to realize, oh, I'm kind of moving upwards. And you see sort of a development and building. But the reason I, I don't like it as much is I would say the vast majority of people using it are using it from a perspective that they believe they know how you should reconstruct. Nine out of 10 people that talk about reconstruction are telling you, oh, by the way, you can deconstruct, but make sure you reconstruct. And it's very much a, I have the right answer. Make sure you do it the way I did it. Um, and what's interesting about these people is often they wouldn't take the marker for deconstruction. They still hold faith fundamentally. And they are actually very fundamental about the way you should deconstruct. You should get rid of that belief about Jesus. Yeah, that's not healthy. But now you should believe this about Jesus and then you'll be fine. Um, now, in saying that, when you break it down to the average person and their journey, I think a lot of us, as we develop and grow, we feel these different stages of life. We maybe certainly early on in deconstruction can definitely feel like that demolition wrecking ball flying through the house and you're basically holding on to your favorite rug and a lamp and that's about it that's what's going to make it out of this building <laughs> and so it feels like crazy and it feels like destruction and everything's falling apart and scary and you're not sure what's going to happen um, and you turn around and look backwards and it's just rubble and it does feel like you look at it and go i'm going to need to build something i need somewhere to live i need something to to exist in um, and I think that's where reconstruction as a concept might be very helpful for people realizing, okay, as I've lost things, I'm going to have to put things in their place. But I do think generally, as we found in the second marker, that we, as we question the core values, we, we find them lacking. The church can't answer them. The, the faith can't answer them. And we go and seek new beliefs. And what I would say is, generally speaking, almost every person I've ever met that's deconstructing is already reconstructing in many ways. They're like I've never met someone that's losing a belief or letting go of a belief that isn't actively going, okay, but what do I believe now then? Like I've, I don't think I've ever met someone that's going, oh, I'm just choosing not to bother. I don't really care. I'm just getting rid of this. And I, I, I don't even know if you can. Have you ever met someone that doesn't believe anything? Like you can't just not believe anything. I, I think like by the very nature of existing, you you have to start tethering yourself to certain ideas. Um, and so I think naturally there's quite a natural process of building that's built into deconstruction. I think it becomes 
uh, a bit more of an avalanche process. I think as you find a bit more stability, as you start to realize that it's not so scary that you're letting go of some of these old beliefs, that you start to find it more exciting, more interesting to question beliefs, you to explore new beliefs, to try on new beliefs and, and see if they work for you. What do you think about them? So I think it can build momentum. And, and at a certain point, it feels like you're starting to gain more than you're losing. And I think that's where people would start to go, oh, I'm, I'm reconstructing, I'm rebuilding something. Um, but I generally don't believe that there's two kind of clear cut um, lines. And what I will say is, again, uh, and this is shown again when we look at um, the, the average person from a psychological perspective, you're going to go through some more psychological shifts in your life. If you're healthy and you're intentional about growing, which you're more likely to do, the more you grow up, the more healthy you become and more able you are to grow up you're going to reconstruct, you're going to start to believe stuff and then give it, gosh, give it five years, 10 years. And you're going to go, ah, uh, maybe not this. And it's all going to start again in a different way or some other idea is going to fall apart. Um, and so I, do, I don't know if I ever believe certainly in a, in a final reconstruction I'm done. Um, and maybe that is a thing that for some people, but I'd argue that's probably a little unhealthy um, to just finish. Uh, but each to their own. I, I, I'd certainly, I'm going to, force anyone on anything but no look i'd be cautious of someone that says they've arrived and that they've they've completely There's a lot of them, believe it or not though yeah 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 there is <laughs> most of them most of them are selling a course or a book um, yeah. Shop car. yeah this is true you've you've talked a lot about deconstruction i mean it is your space and it's something that obviously you've shown your passion and definitely your deep expertise in it you run the deconstruction network can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. I mean, the deconstruction kind of happened by accident. So I talk to dozens of people every day. So if you're listening to this and you need someone to talk to, shoot me a message. I literally, every day, all I do is I chat with people and help them figure out what's, how are they going to navigate this? How are they going to process it? But in the mix of it, you know, uh, of all studies that are done again and again of people that are disaffiliated, de-churched, uh, de de um, converted, de uh, deconstructed, the number one metric of what people grieve and what people miss, it's not their faith in God. It's not their purpose. Um, it's not even their family or, you know, someone that's isolated. them. It's a sense of belonging and community. Um, it's a sense of being a part of something and, and, and having a community that supports you and is there for you. And uh, if we talk about things that church does well, right? I mean, God, that's something that generally, as long as you agree and as long as you tick the right boxes, you're there. You're, you're part of a, a bigger, wider family. And, and what I was finding as I was talking to people, I constantly have people go, hey, look, I'm totally alone. Do you know anyone that's in Sydney? Do you know anyone that's in Austin? Do you know anyone that's in Denver or London or Paris or whatever? And you know what was funny is constantly I'd be like, oh, I was talking like four days ago or five days ago to someone that said the same question. I don't remember which person it was because I talked to dozens, hundreds of people a week. I don't remember who it was that was from Paris. Uh, but yes, there's people in Paris, but I don't know who they are. Um, and honestly, even if I did remember, I certainly wouldn't just give out people's information. Everything I do is very private. I'd maybe go and find them and ask them, but they're now like 120 DMs down the list. So I'm like, I don't know how to connect you. And so I, I kind of had this idea, what if we had um, a completely free resource that was online that people could register and just put their name and um, the city they're in, and that's it. And it put a dot on the map, and you could then type, show me everyone on the map in a 50 mile radius. And you can put in a pseudonym if you're scared about paths are going on and finding you or something, but we've never had instances of that so far in two years, which is really great. But you can type 50 miles from Sydney, show me a radius, or you guys in kilometers as well. And uh, you might have to put up with the the terrible imperial system on the website. And it will show you like, you know, 50 dots around Sydney. And you go, holy crap, I am not alone. And you just start click and message and chat with people. And you might find very quickly, eh, God, that person's crazy. I don't want to meet up with them for a coffee. I'm scared they're going to murder me and put me in the walls. I don't think we have too many people in there like that. But, um, but you will find if you start messaging people, you go, oh, I want to meet up with some of these people for coffee. I want to, you know get our families together and go for a picnic or have a meal or barbecue or something. Um, and what it's done is it's basically just brought people together and it's given people a bit of that community and not that it comes with a prepackaged community. You've got to do the legwork. You've got to start working on that yourself. You've got to go and meet people. You've got to message people. You've got to find people that takes work and it takes time. And I will say if you're in a rural village in India and you're deconstructing, you're much less likely to find someone on there yet. It's still very early days. I think there's about 5,000 people on there, 4,000 in that wheel. Um, and as a side from that, we started to do our 
research through that project. And so people on that site are able to take part in our research and, and that's long-term ongoing research. Uh, uh, and so we, we do research through the deconstruction network as well, but primarily it's just a free resource for people to connect. And so, yeah, everything I do, I'm very passionate about doing it for free because most of us, especially God, if we're in Pentecostal movements, most of us experience quite heavy financial abuse. We've, we, we're used to another person that has um, some form of platform. I try and be very down to earth and I've not, I've not got a very good platform. And if I do ever build one, I always end up trying to destroy it somehow. But I don't want to be another person that you look at and go, uh, here's another guy. He's going to sell me a course. He's going to sell me some books. He's going to make a website where we can find other people but charge us five bucks a month. I, I, that's not what I'm here for. I, I have no desire for that. I don't want people to have a barrier. I don't want people to have that trauma reemerge based on how many years of attending conferences where the only people are there are selling you books and selling you this and taking up another offering and God's like, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Enough of that. <laughs> so yeah, that's the deconstruction network in a very non-concise bubble. <laughs> I think we saw some trauma bubble to the surface there, Phil, when you started talking about money and contributions and that is definitely something <laughs> that we all experience, there's no doubt. Yeah. So we won't be mentioning our Patreon page in this episode. <laughs> I think I just did. <laughs> Hey, Phil, what do you foresee then? Because, you know, this whole deconstruction thing, like when I when I deconverted, that's what it was called, and, uh, you know, even that was was a fairly new term, it, it seems to be something that's risen to the surface. You know, we've got evangelical leaders speaking out against it. We've got, you know, lead singers of, of evangelical Christian bands speaking out against it. What is the future, do you think? I'm, I'm not asking you to look in your crystal ball. I'm just asking you from your expertise, what is the future for deconstruction as as, as a movement or as, as an issue? Sure. I don't, I don't think it's going away. Um, I think we might see, excuse me, I think we might see it further evolving and, and, and might be new terms that evolve in time for different components of it maybe or, or whatever. I'm not sure. Um, just in the same way, like you said, deconversion was a term, disaffiliated was a term for a while, de-churched, like, and all of these things still exist in certain ways. So if you deconstruct, you might deconvert. If you deconvert, you have deconstructed, right? So deconstructed kind of covers a huge gambit, but it also convert, covers people that still stay in church. Um, so it's not as easy to broad stroke with it. Um, as someone that deconverts, I can, I, there's a definition of what they have done. They no longer believe what they used to believe. It's a bit harder with the deconstructing because they might actually still be Christian or they might not. But I think what's interesting is if you look back through different points in history, so you start to see the first kind of exodus of Christianity was in Europe about 70 years ago. And you see post-World War II, you start to see a mass moving away from church attendance, from believing in God. And what's interesting about it was there was no real mechanism for that. There was no, there was no path to follow. There wasn't a clear path that people had done for that. And there certainly wasn't a place to ask questions. So people starting to ask questions they were left with one option. You just become an atheist, right? If you don't, you don't believe in God, then you don't believe in God. And and that was it, right? There wasn't a space in the way that we have today. Um, and so what happened in Europe over the last sort of 70, 60, 50 years, we're seeing occurring much more now in places like Australia, America. It's it becoming a much more prevalent thing for people to start deconverting in the last 20, 30 years in these places um, that's where it's really started to spike in Australia and America specifically. Um, but the difference is in the last 20 years, we've had the internet. Even 20 years ago, you know, it was maybe early. It was, there was news groups instead of Facebook or something like that, you know, but there was space to kind of ask questions. You could type into ask Jeeves or <laughs> whatever the search engine was back then. Um, you know, there was, there was space. Now, God, you can type into Facebook a question and it will bring up a group online of, thousands of people that have asked your question and you can join it and you're part of something. The, the difference is today is there's space for all the gray bits in between the extremes of Christianity versus atheism, right? And so what we're going to start to see more and more is these different gray areas as there's more space, as there's more uh, technology at our fingertips People are going to start to understand things better. They're going to start to understand their questions better. They're going to have better access to resources that give answers. And I think we're going to find people that are 
much more complex and kind of multifaceted. I think we're going to find Christians that don't believe certain things that we couldn't have imagined back in the past. We're also going to find um, people that are agnostic, but still very spiritual or agnostic and completely unspiritual. And, and there's going to be names for some of these kind of positions and, and ideas and terms that probably philosophically, metaphysically, maybe theologically, there's probably been names for a lot of these things for a long time. People have labels, but that's not filtered down to the average person. And I think, Technology is filtering these kind of concepts, these questions, these answers down to the average person. So I think we're going to see more and more. Uh, there's no doubt that the that certainly de-churching, deconverting, um, and de- deconstructing is on the rise. Um, I think it's going to be. A, and then what's interesting, and so this is an interesting component. I think as the wealth of and the stability and the safety of. Um, countries where a lot of people have not had that and are looking to Christianity and church to provide that, like we talked about earlier. So maybe if you're in a rural Indian town and you're, you're, you're not given many options, you're not given much education, you don't have many support systems to get by, you maybe look to a religious support system, and that's really important. But as education becomes more global, as the internet becomes more accessible, as um, poverty is lifted out, as water and simple things that are just appalling that we haven't made globally accessible, and as those things become more available, what we're going to see is less reliance on religion. And so you're going to start to see other parts of the world, the parts maybe where evangelicalism and Pentecostalism are doing really well, we're going to start to see people there starting to deconstruct, starting to question. I already get, you know, I get lots of questions from people in different parts of the world. And I think of quite a few people I've spoken to just this last week. I spoke to like maybe seven or eight people from Nigeria. And I was like, this is really interesting. I, I, I speak to people from Nigeria and Africa very often. But one of the things I noticed about the seven people, I I think it was seven, maybe eight, I spoke to is every single one was a university student, currently a university student, and they were starting to ask questions. And I was like, this is the difference. Now, Nigeria is a very prosperous country and it's it's amazing, you know, in in lots of ways, it's a very uh, great place to be for many people. It's also a very bad place to be for many people by many metrics. The education options are still nowhere near the same way that someone in America or Australia or the UK would have. And so as that's going to get better, as more people go to university, we're probably going to start to see people in Nigeria going, actually, I really needed this church support system and network so I could run my business from my home without education, without uh, loans and finances. I've had to get that through the church and things like that. But once those things start to become less essential, we're going to start to see deconstruction all over again in a new way in new parts of the world. That would be my crystal ball future concept, maybe. But I, I don't know. I'm kind of reimposing what we... The problem is what we're looking at as, you know, even looking at America as this happened in Europe 50, 60, 70 years ago. America isn't in the same place that Europe was 50, 60, 70 years ago. They've got the internet. They've got different things. So we we didn't see a mass exodus of Christians to atheists. What we're seeing is this mass exodus of Christianity to still Christian or semi-Christian or not Christian, but still spiritual. Like there's this whole gray area. So let's assume that we manage to get the world in a better place in the next hundred years if we don't drown in the ocean or you know whatever else would blow up in nuclear war. If we manage to rise everyone out of poverty, if we manage to get the whole world educated to well, good levels and things like that, we don't really know what what technology is on the on the cards. You know, what are we doing? You know, if we're traveling in space or something, what does that do to people's faith? What does that do to how people deconstruct? What new questions do they have? Um, I think it's it's really fascinating to think about, but I just think we do not know what that might look like. We can only just kind of guess based on what we've seen in the past and what we see presently. But I do think we're going to see more and more of this, certainly in America, we'll see certainly more in Australia. I think Australia is getting a beaten right now with all the uh, Hillsong stuff. Thank God, whether whether you believe in God or not, but yeah, yeah, it it certainly is, and everything's evolving there. And look, I think you're right, Phil. Humans will continue to surprise us, and we just don't know exactly where things are going to head. But we look, we are coming to the end. But what we want to do is obviously give you a shout out for the Phil Drysdale show, your your podcast. I mean, it's certainly been something that we've both valued listening to. You've got a great back catalogue of guests there. So if people want to connect there, if people also want to connect to the Deconstruction Network, but how else do people connect with you? Sure. The main place, if I post on social media, it's on Instagram. If I chat with people throughout the day, it's on Instagram. And so 
if you're on Instagram, follow me at, at Phil Drysdale. Um, that's the best place to, to connect. Um, generally speaking, from there, you can get links to everything and anything I do, my research work, the Deconstruction Network, different things like that. But yeah, and if people want to talk anytime, shoot me a, a message. I, I can take a couple of days to reply sometimes, but um, I'm always around, give or take. Instagram is the place. So if you find me on Facebook, it's a graveyard. I left that place a long time ago. Yeah. It's it's interesting. We're obviously older than than you, Phil, and um, we we're only new to Instagram. I mean, we we both had Instagram accounts, but our uh, I was a teenage fundamentalist is only new to Instagram, and we've uh, we've had younger people help us with that. It's a great platform, <laughs> um, and yes. it's it's a good way to get out. So awesome. You're probably trying to get towards the end of its demise. It's pro- we're probably about to move on to something else. <laughs> yeah, I, I often think, God, I really hope this doesn't die and something new comes because I don't know if I've got it in me to learn a new thing. Okay, Phil, thank you very much for today. This has been great. Um, as Brian and I have said, we have listened to your podcast for a while. So in one sense, we feel like we know you, even though you don't know us. But it's been really good, and we're really glad to hear your, you know, your expertise and give you a platform for people to speak uh, sorry for you to speak to people and in, in our listening audience. So thanks very much for being a part of this. Oh, thanks for having me. Honestly, it's a privilege and thanks for what you're doing. I mean, it's just, it's so exciting to see so many people in so many spaces with such diverse backgrounds and, and ways of viewing the world doing this work of helping people go through what is probably one of the hardest things they will ever go through. You know I mean? It is the death of everything, their purpose, their ideas, their relationships there you know, it's just so much dies in, in the process of deconstruction and has to be reborn or, or you know re, re-navigated and that's scary and so yeah thanks for being a part of helping people navigate that it's huge all right brian i'll see you next week hey see you then thanks phil